Now I'm not really too sure how to do this, but I feel the show needs to do something. I'm sure many of the channels will produce something very similar, but here goes. Clive Sinclair has made a massive impact on my life, and many other lives around the world. As a teenager, he became interested in mathematics and computing, with an interest in making things simpler and smaller, and that continued all the way through his life and career. The mould was set, and the world just had to catch up. As early as 1958, he was drawing electronic circuits and listing out components and prices. He became the editor of Practical Wireless magazine, aged just 18, and in 1959 he took up a position at Barnard's, a publishing company where he wrote many books on electronics. In 1961, he set up Sinclair Radionics Limited, with a view to selling his own miniature pocket radio. Taking other jobs to fund his ambition, and still writing books, his micro amplifier soon appeared in adverts in 1962. He was still pushing to get things cheaper and smaller, and produced a series of items including, at the time, the smallest radio in the world, and the X10 amplifier. Many of the products were of interest mainly to electronic buffs or people that liked novelty items. Sinclair continued to design and sell goods, moving into hi-fi amplifiers, a more wider audience. One of the big breakthroughs was the pocket calculator in 1972. This went above and beyond what much larger and more expensive imported models could offer. The first pocket calculator in the world. Now we're heading in the direction we're all familiar with. And there was even a build-it-yourself kit, just like the ones to arrive soon for computers. The calculator was a success initially, and paved the way for the next thing, a miniature television. The Sinclair Microvision was shown at the radio show in 1966, but hadn't matured until much later, and even then there were problems. It finally arrived in 1977, a late delivery, something Sinclair became known for. The Microvision didn't do so well, but it wouldn't be long before Clive took another look at the television market. Next came the Sinclair Digital Watch, known as the Black Watch. This also came in kit form. Again, there were problems that hampered sales. Although the products were innovative, they didn't sell in the numbers needed to keep the company profitable, and they began to post losses. The Black Watch was scrapped eventually. It was costing the company too much, but Clive was aiming for something new, a flat screen television. Back then, he predicted that the man in the street would soon be able to buy a 50 inch television that would mount on the wall. One of many visions that he held that subsequently came true. Sinclair, still in financial difficulty, set up a side company, Science of Cambridge, with Chris Curry leading. Their first attempt was a failed wrist calculator, made of older calculator parts that didn't really make money, not really surprising. Their next product in 1977 was the Mark 14, a much more substantial advanced calculator, leaning towards a microcomputer. In fact, very similar to the Acon System 75, that was more or less a copy of that but with an included keyboard. As the Mac 14 began to sell in decent numbers, Clive regained his interest in microcomputer kits, something he was moving away from as the calculator market was not doing so well. In 1979, Science of Cambridge was renamed Sinclair Research, and Clive took a more active role. Home computers were now on the radar. By this time though, the home computer market was starting to get noticed with the Commodore PET, and the aforementioned Acorn System 75, amongst others, already available. The problem was, though, the price, and this is where Clive had always excelled. It didn't take long, and in January 1980, the Sinclair ZX80 was launched, for less than £100. You could get it in kit form, typically Sinclair, but also pre-built. It had its problems, the screen flickered every time you pressed a key, and the poor membrane keyboard, to mention a few. Compared to the PET at the time though, with prices ranging between £600 and £900, Sinclair caught the eye of enthusiasts, a proper microcomputer for less than £100. You couldn't go wrong. This tiny machine kick-started the home micro industry, albeit slowly. People could now afford a computer, and they could write their own games. This was quickly followed by the massively popular ZX81, again both in kit form and pre-built. A much improved design, with many of the earlier machine's bugs and problems ironed out, although it still had that membrane keyboard. Now the market seemed to be hotting up. Companies built expansions for all kinds of activities. Printers could be attached, 
including Sinclair's own ZX printer. Again, much cheaper and smaller than the industry beer moths like Epson and HP. You could get sound expansions, high-res graphics kits, input-output interfaces, and much more. Small companies sprang up overnight, producing a wide range of business, education, and entertainment titles. Companies that are still around today. You could expand the memory from 1K to 16K with a plug-in memory expansion, or as they were called, a RAM pack, and this opened up more potential. Arcade classics were converted to run on the 16K machine, and you could play Asteroids, Space Invaders, Frogger, and more at home. Sinclair were now on a roll, and their next machine was eagerly awaited. In April 1982, the ZX Spectrum was launched. It had colour, it had 16K, it had high-resolution graphics, it had sound, and a keyboard, sort of. Again, it wasn't long before the extra hardware started to arrive that could do a multitude of things. Music, sound, printing, networking, disk drives, keyboards, light pens, light guns, plotters, and many, many more. A 48K version soon followed, setting the standard for home computers. The game scene too exploded, with thousands of games available across a wide variety of subjects, from space games, adventure games, war games, strategy games, platform games, and the list is endless, really. It was the staple of many playground conversations, and yes, games were pirated and swapped. But it did get the UK moving forward with technology, providing an affordable computer that could do many different things, including helping with your homework. Yeah, right, like we all did that. If it wasn't for the ZX81 and Spectrum, we wouldn't be here now doing this. Clive's foresight, inventiveness, and ability to miniaturize and reduce the price, although often fraught with delays, provided a solid base from which today's gaming and IT industry was built. Many people who work in IT or programming today, of a certain age, started on Sinclair's computers, myself included. Sinclair continued to improve the Spectrum through the 1 to 8K model and the Plus model. It didn't stop there. Sinclair started to branch out into other areas. They continued with computers as well, releasing the Sinclair QL in 1984. Aimed more at businesses, this used Sinclair's Microdive technology for storage, but failed to do well in an already Amstrad-dominated market. It did, however, produce some interesting games, in that they were notable for things other than the game itself. Braticus was a game born from the Imagine crash. Some of the team broke away and wrote this, which is, more or less, Bandersnatch, the famous Lost Imagine mega game. It wasn't particularly good, but notable because of the story. And also, Magnetic Scrolls released the pawn on the QL first, before moving across to 16-bit machines like the Amiga and Atari. Sinclair finally did get their flat-screen TV out in 1983, a clever design showing what could be done with a little imagination and a lot of talent. People wondered why you'd want to watch television on such a small screen back then, but look around you today. How many people are walking about watching YouTube or TikTok or whatever on their phones? Now we have to mention the C5 that launched in 1985. Again, people laughed at this. Why would you want an electric car? Well, you just have to look at the news to see that they're becoming more popular. Yes, it was small, and yes, it looked comical, although I thought it looked cool, but it was their first attempt. It was the ZX80 of cars, if you like. Sinclair had planned a whole range of electric vehicles, much larger, that looked like normal family cars. Then there was the forgotten PC200, launched in 1988, Sinclair's last bid to get into the business market. A DOS-compatible small form-factor PC with a monitor and mouse. Anyone would think he was trying to copy Amstrad. We haven't even mentioned the overseas things like the Timex deal, and the many clones around the world, or even the wafer-scale technology Clive was working on, or the mini-portable Z88 machine. Again, it didn't take off as expected. I think he will be remembered, though, for the things he probably thought that was a small step to much larger projects. The Spectrum. It took off faster and was more successful than I think he imagined, but it was probably the product that made the most impact. Still loved today, still supported today with new games and hardware, and still very much important in so many people's lives. If I have one memory of Clive, it was when he did an online chat on Micronite 800 in the early 80s, I think. Celebrity chat line it was called. People typed in their question and he, or someone sat with him, typed the answer back. This was after the Spectrum had been handed over to Amstrad, and I asked him 
if he had any plans to come back into the home computer market, and he replied, possibly, but it would have to be a very fast 3D system. I was so excited that he'd replied. So to Sir Clive, for that reply, and for the years of happiness you have given me and countless other people, I thank you. Now I expect Jeff had a similar experience growing up with Sinclair, so let's go through a few things then. So Jeff, do you remember the calculator? It was a very good innovation. I don't think I've ever even seen one. Me neither, apart from pictures. I may have seen one at a show once, but can't quite remember 100%. I saw an interview with Chris Curry where he said the the parts of the manufacturer was about £11 and they sold it for something like £79. Right, that's a hell of a profit. That is a hell of a profit. And he sold ten, at least tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of them. Right, OK, I thought they were making a loss. No, I think they made a load of money on that. In fact, I think the profits from the calculator funded a lot of future research at Sinclair Research or whatever it was called back then. So what about the first attempt at television, the Sinclair Microvision? I have seen one of them. I don't, I didn't remember it from back in the day, but I've definitely seen one. Those are the quite chunky ones, weren't they? There was a flat, there was a flat one as well. I don't think I've ever seen a flat one. Right, that, that's a little bit later. Um, so the next thing that came along was the digital watch, the, the black watch. No, don't think I've seen one of them. No, I haven't. I used to have one of them crappy digital ones, like the Casio ones at school, that you have to press the button to see, but nothing like a Sinclair one. So we'll skip forward to the ZX80 then. I don't think I've even seen one, but I'm definitely aware of it. I think I may have seen one in real life. I haven't got one. They go for stupid amounts of money on eBay. So, okay, ZX81? I had a friend whose brother had one, and I do remember going round to his house and we played on it one evening. It had Ram Pack Wobble. <laughs> Everybody had a Ram Pack Wobble. You need a bit of blue tack, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I do, I do remember pressing a key and the thing just going out. Uh, it just crashed. It was rampack. Indeed. Bubble. And that, that brings us on to something that you may not have heard of, ZX Spectrum. No, I uh, can't remember that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. It was the, the rubber key thing. looked really nice. That's the one. So, like me, did it change your life? It, it made my life completely flip the opposite direction so before that I had no no idea about computers I was working in a factory and the ZX81 came out and I got that then I got the Spectrum and from that moment on it was like I don't know a switch had turned on and I just I knew what I wanted to do from that point on I'd say it definitely changed the course of my life I was 11 when it came out so it was it was almost you know like kids today don't know life without a smartphone I think from that moment on I didn't really know life without computers but I used to program on it uh, in BASIC. Right. Always, uh, always wanted to learn machine code, but never did. Me too. Me too. I, I, what do you do? Do you play a game or do you learn machine code and read book after book? You know, I, I just went for jetpack and. Yeah. Well, we all went for jetpack and things like that, and attic attack, and horoscope skiing, and Chucky egg, and Harrier attack, and night law, and alienate, and and the list goes on and on and on. And, and did you have discussion stroke arguments in the school about um, Spectrum versus Commodore? No. Um, I only knew one kid who had a Commodore because, yeah, basically the Spectrum ruled in, in my school. Everybody who had a computer had a Spectrum. Oh, well, um, in my school, we didn't, we didn't actually have computers until probably six months um, before I left and they were only BBCs because I'm much older. So we never we never had that discussion in the uh, playground. We we had a spectrum. Um, I remember one maths class. Uh, the maths teacher got got the ZX spectrum out and he loaded the Horizon tape and I think he loaded the you know the breakout clone uh, and a few kids had a had a couple of games on it and then he put it away and that was the only time in school I ever saw that spectrum. We did have B- we had BBCs later. Which of course had much better keyboards. I do. I do remember the keyboard on the BBC being so much better than the Spectrum. So what about what about the Pocket TV then? No, I think as I said earlier, no, I've never, uh, I've never seen one. I didn't know anyone with one. I, I have seen the big one, the big chunky one, that's uh, kind of about. Well, it was. It was actually. It was about the size of a VHS video cassette in its box. Let's skip on to the C five. Yeah. 
We had a school production of Joseph and his amazing technical dream course. And there's a bit where Joseph comes out in his chariot, and the C5 was his chariot. <laughs> really? Have you got any photographs? No, I haven't, unfortunately. It was on loan from Commerce. Um, and I never got a go in it. All the boys wanted to have a go, and the teacher says, no, you can't, you'll break it, we need to give it back to Comet when we're finished. <laughs> I've seen two in the flesh, uh, one outside a charity shop, which was in a bit of a poor state. I really should have bought that and rescued it, and I've seen one in a car museum. And the only, to be honest with you, after after the Spectrums, and then of course I got Sol Tamstrad and the C5, the only thing I really remember is the Zyke. Which is the only thing I didn't put in the video. <laughs> I forgot until you mentioned it. Just as well I mentioned it then, Paul. I'm slightly ashamed. I have seen one of those as well. That was in the same car museum as the C5. I've never seen one. I remember, it was on the news, wasn't it? Sinclair comes back with this Zyke thing. It had, it had tiny wheels, didn't it? Absolutely minute wheels, yeah, and small, apparently it was Im- impossible to ride. It's very bumpy, apparently, because of the small wheels, yeah. Sir Clive Sinclair was definitely obsessed with electric vehicles. That was his downfall. Well, he knew what the future was. No one else did. He did. <laughs> yeah, but he was, he was miles ahead of his time. Literally 30, 40 years ahead of his time. So what, what, what would you, how would you sum up your memories of Sinclair and Clive? himself. He was the man off the telly who would come and show all these... It was Tomorrow's World. He looked like he belonged on Tomorrow's World. And definitely an innovator. I mean, he almost seemed to come out with things and throw them at the public and see what stuck. Pocket calculator, huge success. Small, sufficiently powered, cheap computer for the masses, massive success. At that time, and that was the most affordable computer for the masses... You said it changed the course of your life. I think it changed the course of the country. 